All right, I will call to order the City of West Bend Licensing Board for July 6, 2020 at 6.25 p.m. All members are present and accounted for. First item is approval of the minutes consisting of the Licensing Board regular meeting of June 15th. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. There's been a motion second. Discussion or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Wonderful. I will move on to agenda items for consideration. Uh, number two, six-month Class B beer license for the West Bend Baseball Association, West Bend Baseball, 800 North Main Street, Carl M. Cuss Memorial Field. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Wonderful. Next is item number three, second-hand article dealer license renewal. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Been motion second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Wonderful. Number four, second hand jewelry dealer license renewal. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. It's been motion second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Number five, coin and precious metals or stone dealer license renewal. Motion to approve. Second. And motion second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Wonderful. And lastly, number six, massage establishment renewal. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. It's been motion second. If there's no discussion, all those in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And then I will adjourn by the call of the chair. All right. I would like to call the order of Board of Public Works. We have two items on the agenda. Um, the first item is going to be minutes from June 15, 2020. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion on second. Any changes? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item number two, award contract 20-16 Building demolition at 2100 Northwestern Avenue. Emily. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here tonight with a recommendation to award contract 2016 uh, building demolition at 2100 Northwestern Avenue to the MRD group of West Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, dating back to March of 2000, the city's been involved in various procedures um, to address safety, issue, safety issues that were created by the unsatisfactory condition of the building at 2100 Northwestern Avenue. Um, in July of 2019, um, the Washington County Circuit Court determined that the raise order issued by the city in September of 2015 is valid and enforceable, and the city could proceed with raising the property. Um, so the project now consists of the demolition of the existing building superstructure down to the concrete slab um, and we're going to leave the concrete slab in place. We're not planning for any demo work below grade or for any environmental remediation other than what's needed um, to take down the superstructure itself. Um, there will be a separate agenda item tonight um, during the finance committee to talk about funding for the contract. Um, we received eight bids for contract 2016 at 10 a.m. on June 26. Um, the bid from New Berlin Grading didn't have the addendums and so it was therefore not eligible for reading. The remaining seven bids um, that we received are summarized in the memo for you and the table does include the bids as calculated after math errors were corrected. Um, so city staff has reviewed the low bid um, as well as the qualifications of the MRD group who was the low bidder and based on um, similar work they've performed in the past, we would recommend that they are capable of performing the work um, described in the plans and specifications for the project. Uh, so we would recommend that the board award contract 2016 in the amount of $299,900 to the MRD group at the unit prices specified in their bid for work actually performed. We're also recommending um, the board establish a contingency fund of um, $30,100, which is approximately 10% of the total bid for a total allocation not to exceed $330,000 for the contract. And we did want to note that the contingency amount is slightly higher than the 5% we normally ask for just in case any um, unforeseen environmental issues should arise during demo work. Okay, thank you, Emily. Do I have a motion on the floor? Second. Okay, I have a first motion and second. 
Any discussions, any questions for Emily? If there are none, um, I have a motion on the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Being no further business before the Board of Public Works, I adjourn. I'm going to call to order the uh, the meeting for finance. Um, first on the agenda is going to be uh, Carrie Winkelbauer and Baker Tilly. Uh, they're here to speak about the 2019 audit presentation. So, Carrie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we have John Rader and Andrea Jansen joining us virtually tonight uh, from Baker Tilly, and they are going to present the 2019 audit results. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you, can you hear us okay? I can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for having us. Um, as mentioned, my name is John Rader. I'm a director with Baker Tilly, and I've been part of the audit for a number of years. Along with me is Andrea Jansen. Andrea is a partner in our team and has been uh, part of the audit as well and is responsible for signing your audit report this year. Normally when I present as a committee, I say stop me at any time and ask questions, but I think out of the uh, current scenario, uh, we'll, we'll wait till the end to see if you have any questions for us. I also wanna thank you for having us remotely. Um, we do appreciate this and we've been doing a lot of meetings pretty successfully in this manner. Andrea and I are going to share this. She's going to go through the financial highlights with you, um, which would be a good way, has been a good way to summarize uh, your financial statements. But before I turn it over to Andrea, I'm going to mention just a few things uh, in general terms about, about the audit. We actually had, uh, we were at the city to do some preliminary work on site over the winter, like we always do. But this year, we actually had the audit scheduled for the week of March 16th, and as we're all aware, that's when everything uh, our world began to change. So the reason I mentioned this is because it took uh, a big effort from Carrie and her team and our team as well, quite honestly, to work together to do the audit the entire week remotely. So uh, thanks to Carrie, her team, and the city for working closely with us. I don't think this could have been done 10 years ago. Uh, but with the ability to share documents electronically, share screens on computers, and we had regular meetings throughout the day, um, it, it, it went very well. So thank you, thank you again, once again for allowing us to, to work together to pull that off. We were able to audit all the balances during the week like we normally do. And then after that, uh, we prepare a draft of the city's financial statements. And then we issue that to Carrie for her review. And in the process, she prepares some documents for our review. So once we kind of work through all those different items, we issue and final. And we did that uh, back on June 26th. That's an important date because there's a, there's a deadline of June 30th for the city to submit the report, their comprehensive annual financial report, or CAFRA as we call it, to the Government Finance Office Association, GFOA, uh, for what will hopefully be the second year that they will receive, the city will receive uh, this prestigious award. Last year in 2018 was the first year that the city attempted to do this. And that's a big hurdle to get over. There's a lot of documents um, that need to be uh, obtained and pulled together uh, for the CAFR to submit. And especially the first year, it's a big effort. So not only did the city do this, but they did it successfully. So congratulations to the city for receiving this this award it really is it's the highest level of financial reporting our government can achieve if you haven't taken a look at the CAFR, i encourage you to do so uh, you may have a copy electronically or in paper format but i know it's on the city's website as, as well andrea and i look at as independent reviewers and and auditors as well a lot of different CAFRs, and i can tell you the city of west bend's report is a really nice looking report so uh, once again i encourage you to take a look at it I'm not going to walk you through that. As I mentioned, Andrew is going to touch on the numbers. Uh, but I just want to mention a couple of things, high level. A CAFR is divided into sections. In the beginning, it's the there's the introductory section. 
And there's a letter in there called the transmittal letter uh, that's prepared by the city. It talks about a lot of different things going on in the city, economic development initiatives and other things that in, in large part are, are non-financial. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. There's also an organizational chart and a few other areas. The bulk of it is the financial section, and that runs about 100 pages, a lot of budget to actuals and footnotes. And if you're really into numbers, that's a great place to spend some time because that's where the bulk of the, the effort for the audit and the preparation on, on the city side place. And in the very back of the CAFR, there are some statistical tables uh, that provide a whole bunch of information, a lot of it for the last 10 years. And when you're thinking about government built financial reporting, one of the unique things about it is not so much uh, where is it at the end of the year, but how has it been trending? And that's what GFOA's intent here is to demonstrate this, our fund balance level is going up, they're going down, the debt loads, uh, taxable base and a whole bunch of other uh, demographic uh, taxpayers who were the largest taxpayers nine years ago versus today. Um, so some very interesting information that, I, again, I encourage you to take a look at that as well. The main thing you look for us in this in the CAFR, though, is to provide you an opinion. And that's just two or three pages in your report. Um, but it's really what you're looking for from an external CPA firm. We issued, once again, a, what we call an unmodified opinion, which is really a clean opinion uh, on your financial statements, which means they're prepared according to generally accepted accounting principles. Um, that's easy to say, but these days with so many GASBs um, that have to be followed, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a large effort. And the city implemented several new ones this year, including 74 around their OPEP trust, 84 fiduciary activities, 88 for certain debt disclosures. So there are some things that uh, definitely had to be worked through this year. The other report that we issue is commonly referred to as a management letter or the internal control report. This year it's been revamped considerably. I think it's a much more readable document and I encourage you to take a look at that too. If nothing else at a high level. It's called the reporting insights. And it has in it kind of critical information again, that you really hire us to do. And that's to report any, any internal control related matters. Um, there's other reportable required communications in there, uh, such as any disagreements with, the, with, with management or uh, consultations or anything of that nature, which I can assure you there, there were none, uh, all of that went well. As well as a host of informational points that as members of the council you may be interested in. Uh, it's about four or five pages with hyperlinks, uh, and these aren't all financial. They're uh, things that are just relevant to governments these days. As well as, like I said, the GASBs that have been implemented and some that are just around the back. So a lot of good information. And again, uh, if you have some time to think about that. So I'm going to be quiet, and, and I'll, turn it back, I'll turn it over to Andrew to talk about the actual numbers. Thanks, Don. Um, let me try and share my screen here. Okay. So um, this is the financial highlights document that you should have also received. Um, we basically put this together uh, to, so that we can look at some of the key metrics from the city's financial statement um, without having to page through the CAFR itself here for the purposes of this meeting. So um, just on this first page, um, John and myself are obviously here tonight, and then Jody Dobson is also um, the partner involved with the utility fund portion of the audit. So on page one here of this report, we're looking at the general fund fund balance. So as a reminder, your general fund is the primary operating fund for the city. Um, use that fund to pay for things like police, fire, finance, um, administration, street maintenance, parks and recs, all kinds of things. Um, and then when we talk about fund balance, we're talking about the residual equity. So in simplified terms, that you know, your assets, including money owed to the city, less the liabilities, you know, money owed to others. And then we further break it down in this chart here into different categories. So um, starting with the bottom non-spendable, that's really the most restrictive. And then as you move up, 
Um, so the unassigned category, they're, then we're kind of at the least restrictive or really no planned use for those funds um, with the total line at the top. So at the end of 2019, the total general fund balance um, was about 8.4 million. And that is down from the prior year about 5%. Um, but when we look below here um, to the summarized income statement, um, you can see that your final budget numbers actually plan for a $1.3 million loss. So your actual result um, and that loss of 412,000 roughly um, was actually better than you had planned. So um, really no concerns here, even though the fund balance in total did go down. Most of the categories are really um, stable, which is another thing that we look for um, that is, I would say an indicator of, of health there. Um, and then the, the other comment I was going to have here on the summarized income statement is that your actual expenditures and other financing uses um, were below budget by about 3%. So um, you're really in a pretty tight range with, with your plans. So your planning controls and tools, um, I would say, are, are working relatively well. So moving on to page two of this handout, Still, we're focusing on general fund <coughs> fund balance. Um, but with this chart, we are looking at the trend over time. Uh, so, scooch this down. So, the last five years, the green line is your general fund unassigned fund balance as a percentage of your prior year budgeted revenue, or sorry, excuse me, subsequent year budgeted revenue. Um, and you can see that that green line is within um, within the policy range. So the policy minimum is the orange, reddish, orange line, and then the policy maximum is the black line. The policy did change in 2019, as you probably know, um, and it does now incorporate some um, comparable uh, information. So that is gonna cause a little bit of um, fluctuation in where your policy lands each year, um, but you can see that it did widen the range um, and really you're you're within the range, so no concern here. The blue dots are other um, reference values. So switching gears away from fund balance, the next um, couple of graphs here talk about general obligation debt. So general obligation debt um, is debt that's supported by the tax levy. And the black line at the top of this chart is the um, debt limit, the statutory debt limit. So that's 5% of the city's equalized value. And the green line is the actual, so your actual general obligation debt outstanding each year. And you can see that these lines are trending away from each other. So um, your equalized value is increasing and your debt outstanding um, is decreasing. And I, and I believe that that downward trend in your debt outstanding is intentional. Um, and you can see that with your new debt policies in 2019, um, which is the orange dot, um, you are expecting to have a lower level of debt than you. She's back. Am I back? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the other information on this chart, debt outstanding. So you'll notice that your revenue debt has been paid off in, in 2019, and there's just a small capital lease, um, which is the only other thing outside of the general obligation debt at year end. Um, we added this new link here um, it'll take you to um, this Wisconsin Policy Forum, which has a lot of tools, and specifically there are tools to compare yourself um, to other municipalities. Um, 
you can compare related to debt. There's a whole host of information out there. So I would encourage you, if you are looking for comparative information, um, definitely check out um, that website. So still talking about debt here, but looking at it a different way. Um, we're looking at what you're spending on debt in the governmental activities um, compared to non-capital expenditures. So again, the green line is your actual percentage here. Um, the orange line is the policy maximum. Um, and then the black dots are the median values. Um, these numbers are slightly above LC and the median numbers. Um, but I really don't have concerns here because um, if you remember on the previous graph, we're trending downward in debt outstanding. So, you know, having higher payoffs than maybe your peer group um, is kind of expected until you get um, down towards where you want to be for your debt service. So, um, I would say these trends make sense and, and really aren't concerning, although you are slightly above your policy. So then switching gears again, um, just the last two pages here, take a look at your utility funds. Um, these are enterprise funds, which are really self-supporting through user charges or rates. Um, the first one we're gonna look at here is the water utility. Um, as a reminder that this is regulated by the PSC of Wisconsin. So when you see those authorized rates of return at 4.89% at the top, um, those are set by the PSC and the last rate increase that the city had for its water utility was in 2011. Um, you're working on a 2020 rate case, a year 2020 rate case that is in process. So when we look at the operating results, um, no changes in rates. So what we're seeing here is that revenue line um, over the last five years, and if you really look closely, it's ever so slightly trending downward. Um, we see that that's consistent with industry trends um, as it relates to water conservation efforts. Um, the operating expenditures, or excuse me, operating expenses that black line is really what's driving the increase in your actual rate of return. Um, so in 2018, there were a few um, additional uh, maintenance costs due to some rehab with well number five um, that you didn't have again in 2019. So those costs dipped down slightly this year. Some of the other metrics we look at in the utility funds, um, the first being unrestricted cash reserve. So typically you would want at least three months of cash on hand. Um, you can see in the green numbers here at the end of the year, you had um, over 11 months on hand. Um, so that is a healthy balance. You can see next the next groupings of information, the debt coverage. So since the revenue debt was paid off in 2019, those no longer apply. And lastly, that bar graph um, shows the split in um, the investment in plants. So about 14% of your plants for the water utility um, is financed through debt. Um, the rest is, is owned, those assets are owned. Um, so no concerns with that um, ratio there. And lastly, we'll move over to the sewer utility. So a lot of the same information here, um, except for that the sewer utility is not regulated by the PSC. Um, the late rates here for the sewer utility last increased in 2006. So there was an approved rate increase for um, 2020 at the beginning of the year, but that won't impact um, the operating results that we're seeing here. So again, the green line is the operating revenues. We expect that to trend similar to the water utility um, because that's based on usage. And then the operating expenses, these are up a little bit this year due to some flooding and leak repairs at the treatment plant. So um, I wouldn't expect that that's a trend that would continue, um, more just kind of a one year blip. Um, unrestricted cash reserves, again, very healthy um, ratio there, 17 months of cash on hand, um, no debt coverage requirements since the revenue debt is paid off. And um, there is a very, very small amount of debt finance capital. It's less than 1%, so that's really not registering on your, on the 
final bar chart there. So those, um, I guess, were the primary or key metrics that we wanted to take a look at. Um, and I will open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Andrea? Oh, oh sorry, Mr. Allen. Um, you talk about uh, comp comparing us to comparable cities of a range of population of 30,000 to 150,000. Can you get us a list of the cities the actual cities in Wisconsin that we are compared to, we're sort of at the bottom end of that scale, population-wise. I caught, I caught a part of that. I, I think we're talking about the comparative metrics here. Um, yes. You're right that the range is pretty um, wide from 30,000 um, up to 150,000, I think it was. Um, and you are on the lower end of that range. I can share that list um, with Carrie. And those, I don't want to say they're artificially set, but you know, the website that we provided um, for comparative metrics, I would say that may be a good place for you to go um, to decide who you actually want to compare yourself with, um, and in which communities you feel like you, you know, are best in line with. Yeah, if you can get those to carry, she can get them to the council. Thank you. Okay, I can do that. Anyone else have questions? All right. Any other questions? I don't think so. Are we? Uh, are we? Thank you guys uh, for coming and presenting to us. We appreciate your time and um, your reports. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. Um, we can move on then um, for the Finance Committee. Um, we have the approval of uh, regular meeting minutes from June 1st that need to be approved. If I have a, a motion. Motion to approve. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, all right, and then we have uh, three items uh, for consideration uh, this evening. Um, first up, we have a disallowance of claim for Mr. Tom Rose. Um, this is a kind of a standard uh, insurance denial, um, and then it'll go back to the insurance companies. So that's why it's it's set to be disallowed. Um, do I have a motion? Motion to deny the claim. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, we also have a motion, uh, or I'm sorry, an agenda item to disallow a claim for CRB Corporation, uh, Linda Miller. Um, same thing for the insurance denial to go back uh, through insurance. Um, do I have a motion, motion to? Motion to deny. Deny? Second. All right, thank you. Do we have a second? Yeah, second. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Justice. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Um, and then the last um, item for consideration is a resolution authorizing the transfer of funds for the demolition of 2100 uh, Northwestern Avenue. And uh, Jay is going to kind of give us a rundown on that. So that resolution is included in your packet. It's page 304 of 304 <laughs> after the long audit report. Uh, the, the four items that break down the, the one that you just uh, approved um, tonight the building demolition with the 30,000 in contingency is listed there and then the other three items are uh, contract with Kunkel engineering to help us with the bid specs they've they've been working with Max and Emily on the specs so that's the cost for their involvement Tetra Tech is our contract and environmental consultant they did the actual testing within our within that building uh, the the testing for asbestos and the pre um, work that needs to be done in order for a contractor to bid and um, 
those bids are now in, so that 26,000 has been expended and will attempt to be recouped. And Ian can talk through that with you all. And then the last item listed is the $6,200. It's kind of a sub of Tetra Tech environmental disposal. That's for the actual disposal of the contents of some drums that are still located within that building. Those drums need to be handled and, and disposed of properly. They've been tested for the content. And so that $6,200 is a solid quote of what it will cost to dispose of the actual drums that are still hanging out in the Permaco building. So total cost is 391,000 as Max presented to you all. And, and we had a conversation about when we were going for permission to bid this project that those monies will be um, coming from, we don't have a budgeted for in 2020, but coming from fund balance. It's a, it's a number that we've been prepping for and why you just heard from Andrea and our auditors that we maintain a healthy fund balance. So when projects like this, a 20 year um, discussion of a building that needs to come down in order for it to be a, in a more safe situation that we have the funds available to do so. <clears throat> Motion so, to approve. Oh. Second. So I was gonna just fill in the details as far as recouping funds. Um, so traditionally under a raise order, the methodology we would use to recoup the funds would be to assess the property uh, for the cost of raising. Um, that works pretty well for houses that are dilapidated, you know, where we're paying $18,000 to raise the, the building. Um, in this case, obviously, it's going to be a lot more difficult to recoup this money. Um, the site is it has significant contamination from the uh, Orangeburg pipe, the material that was produced there. Um, for everybody who, anybody who's unfamiliar with it, it was the uh, old cellulose pipe that they infused with uh, tar, essentially, uh, to create to create a you know waterproof conduit. Uh, they from what we can tell, they essentially uh, would throw that down and use it as traffic bond in the parking areas and just grind it into the ground. So there's significant contamination there and the DNR is, you know, working through that. Um, that's on the, you know, the outer grounds, not the building itself. There's, um, so it, it is a difficult site to recoup. It's not like we're just gonna put a $330,000 assessment on the tax bill and expect to be paid for it. Um, the other option we do have under the lawsuit that was filed to ratify the raise order is to assess a, to get a civil judgment uh, for all or a portion of this, uh, the costs. Um, so we're, we're, we are still assessing the options. Uh, it's going to be the long haul to recoup the funds, obviously, because, you know, this, all we're doing is raising the property and taking down the dilapidated, dangerous building. We're not taking any other steps after that because we don't own the property. Are, um, are legal matters ongoing as far as that goes? To some degree, there's an appeal going, but okay. you know, we're handling that. Um, the, we have the judgment. We had a motion to reopen the case that was thrown out uh, by, or you know, rejected by Judge Martins at the beginning of the year. So we're, we're moving forward with that. Um, and we do have permission under the original judgment to, to come back in and get a monetary judgment, um, to reopen and get the monetary judgment if that's the route we choose. Um, so we are weighing options. Sure. I, I'm not gonna <laughs> talk all, you know, uh, pie in the sky and think we're gonna get repaid for this anytime soon, but we will take steps to at least make the judgment of the record. So if down the road something happens with this, we may recoup some the money or all of the money but is this a private person that owns this or a company uh, it is an llc that owns it's an llc it. that owns it okay correct so yeah which creates difficulties because you know it's an llc yeah get it <laughs> against the llc and the it llc goes belly dissolve down. yeah yes okay right. I know if I can just say that uh, what Jay alluded to and Emily that this project's been going on this conversation's been going on for 20 years and I get calls and comments and questions about it all the time and I know Barton is ex kind of excited to see this happening so very visible yeah at least the folks in that neighborhood so thank you mm -hmm. thank you guys for keeping that moving 
are there any plans to fence the property once the building comes down so that it doesn't become an attractive place for people to go play I don't believe there's plans to go around the perimeter with a fence. However, there is um, a lower level, um, like a basement area, that we'll, we, we will be putting a fence up so that no one can fall into that, that basement area. So there's some protection there. So. And that's included in the 330,000? Yeah. Yep. Are there any hazards to the public by not having some kind of control access control to the property if it has environmental concerns I from what I recall of the environmental reports most of the like I said they were they were grinding it into the ground as traffic bound I think it's under uh, it's several feet of you know pavement and dirt at this stage of the game it's it's not right on the surface it's also not mobile uh, because it's you know it's essentially tar contamination so it's pretty solid where it's at it's not like gaseous or anything like that um, ultimately I mean the difference between this and some of the other sites is this isn't our property we're very limited in what we can do you know with the fencing we're very limited as to what we can do outside of the raising itself you know, we have a raise order. We don't have a order that allows us to improve the property in any manner. So, and just to be clear, none of this three hundred and ninety-one thousand goes to remediation. It's all just making it safe. It's not remediating the property so that it's in a clean state. Thank you. Uh, so it sounded like we had a motion and a second. Um, so any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Um, and with no further business uh, being before the Finance Committee, I adjourn the Finance Committee. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'll call to order the City of West Bend Common Council uh, meeting for July 6, 2020. Hope everyone had a wonderful July 4th holiday weekend. Uh, all members of the council are present and accounted for. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag states of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have 20 items on tonight's agenda. The first is a presentation by Enterprise regarding possible lease program of city passenger vehicles. We have uh, Matt Jaskowiak. You got that right? Yep. Uh, here from Enterprise, uh, some of the council who have uh, been here for a little while might uh, recognize Matt. They did do a presentation to us a little while ago now. Um, discussions have continued between administration, staff, and myself to continue exploring a lease program uh, for our vehicles. Uh, Matt's going to give us a kind of high-level overview of what that could possibly look like, and we'll go from there. Sounds Turn good. it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, Matt Jaskowiak with Enterprise. I've um, been with Enterprise for going on nine years now, and my primary responsibility is to reach out to government and non-government entities to seek new business opportunities. So that's my primary role with Enterprise. Hi, I'm Brett Felsman, Sales Manager for Enterprise Fleet in Wisconsin, and uh, I'll let Matt take it from here. Thank you. Um, so today, the current situation is we've been working with Jay and his team for almost north of 18 months now. And the whole goal is to identify what the current state of your, your vehicle operation is today and to understand if there's benefits and opportunity to move forward with Enterprise with a funding, and a funding solution uh, with how we operate our fleet management services and programs. So the current situation is uh, roughly 68% of the current vehicles under the non-pursuit vehicles of the city of West Bend is uh, 10 years or older. Um, on average, it would take about 16 and a half years to cycle through all 20 some odd vehicles based on your current acquisition trends over the last 10 years. So that is the current situation. Uh, the current objective, and I, got, I can scroll through here too. Uh, the objective is to understand how our open end equity lease and our funding mechanism can help your tax paying dollars support a lease program uh, managed with enterprise here locally. 
Um, it'll help replace your, your aged vehicles with newer, healthier vehicles that have better fuel economy, better safety technology. And ultimately the savings equates to about $200,000 over the next 10 years by running a healthier uh, vehicle, uh, fleet of vehicles with Enterprise, capitalizing on a few things. So taking advantage of the government buying power, which you currently have access to today, and then taking advantage of our cash flow benefit of utilizing our leasing method. Uh, it's a lease to own. It's a basically a cash flow benefit that the lease is written to a reduced book value at the end of its life. So uh, the city would still retain ownership benefits of the vehicle. So after we remarket those units, you guys do recoup the, recoup the equity back from those units and help apply that, uh, basically take your current asset and pay for a future asset uh, for the replacement vehicle. So ultimately when we looked at uh, a replacement strategy, there was multiple, but the most cost effective for your taxpayers is really to flip all your current 22 vehicles. There's a total, I believe, of 25 right now. We're defleeting by a couple vehicles. They're just underutilized and not needed. Um, so we're saving some uh, taxpaying dollars there as well. But ultimately, by flipping the entire fleet from 22 old vehicles to 22 new, we're going to generate $200,000 of savings by operating close to a two year cycle versus your 16 and a half year cycle. So rotating the fleet out every two years or so, utilizing the high end equity of the vehicle's value in the public sector where we can sell vehicles on your behalf versus just the public auction, which is the source you guys use today. So ultimately high level, that's the supporting evidence you're gonna see in the analysis and synopsis that you have in front of you. Um, it'll also show you a replacement strategy of what vehicles are currently active today Far right column will show you what vehicles uh, Jay and his team have agreed upon to, to replace them with. And then the analysis will break it down line by line for you to show exactly how that leasing method works by utilizing the current equity and the city's fleet today. And then understanding how operating costs will then go down having healthier vehicles. And then every couple of years, we're gonna utilize the newer vehicle equity to help buy down and pay for the future vehicles coming in. With the sustainable savings after um, you're fully penetrated is about $13,500 per year to run newer, healthier vehicles, capitalizing again on the buying power of government entities, taking advantage of the selling power of what vehicles are worth in the public market that we can help sell for you on your behalf. There's also references with other government entities that we are currently working with, so I'll highlight just a few. City of Wausau, City of Manitowoc, City of Oak Creek. Uh, the City of La Crosse is the newest customer in the government sector for Enterprise. Um, we also work with 15 plus different counties and multiple departments in each county that we do work with. Um, we also uh, are members of Sourcewell. I do believe the City of West Bend is a member of Sourcewell. So it's an opportunity for government agencies to take advantage of their membership of Sourcewell to look at vendors and services to help mitigate time and costs and understand who's got the best value. So nationally, we won their RFP. So in hindsight, you guys typically go to RFP for bids on multiple different projects and services. For example, the city of La Crosse utilized the membership of Sourcewell to bypass the typical RFP process to help uh, speed up the process, save time and money and resources for their for their taxpayers. And ultimately, we won the national RFP for Sourcewell. So we do have the scorecard on there with other vendors that have par participated in that event as well. Um, and we do have contact direct information to the Sourcewell rep if there's anyone that has questions about the membership partnership and the partnership that Enterprise won there. So. Um, also references, we have direct contacts at the city of Manitowoc, Steve Corbell, he's a Steve, or he's the finance director there. Uh, Kenosha Unified School District, it's a long lasting client of ours. Um, Kevin Christone's a maintenance supervisor down there. And then the city of Wausau, uh, they're on their third or fourth round of vehicles now, so about six, seven years of partnership. So all in all, that's the presentation that we have today. The goal for tonight is to just get the motion to move forward um, to continue the process with, with Jay and his team. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll open it up to any questions if there is. Alderman Dilnick. Just so you know, we didn't get this information. Mm -mm. Nope, nope, it was just brought tonight and presented as a presentation. We'll, we can share it afterwards. Okay. Yep. Jay has what you would need. Okay. Um, so because of that, it was a little hard to follow, um, but I wanted to ask if a city does this and its motor vehicles all become enterprise motor vehicles and then the city decides this is not working out 
Um, one analogy is w w when a city uh, is induced to get rid of its public works, its garbage collection, they get rid of all the garbage trucks and there's no going back. Is that analogous to this? Once we turn everything over to leasing from enterprise, would we face a huge expense in now resuming purchasing our own vehicles? Yeah, I mean, good question. So to answer that question, I'll answer that in two ways. One is that at any time, should you want to cancel this program, you can essentially pay for the remaining balance on that vehicle and you can own it outright. So at that point, you could take ownership of that vehicle. Secondly, that we buy these vehicles so well that at any point, uh, we have a lot of these vehicles flipping at 12 months where you can sell them for the exact same amount that you actually purchased them for. So it's really a very low risk uh, proposition for the city in two ways. One is you can become the owner of the vehicle at any time if you want to. And then two is you can hand it back into enterprise at almost any point and you're at a break even or you have equity coming back to you on that vehicle. Okay. Are any of these fire or police department vehicles? Um, if they are, they're just more administrative style vehicles, Jay? The ch uh, fire chief's vehicle is in this list, yes. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I saw Alderman Allen, then I'll go to Justice. Yeah, my, my question was what vehicles specifically are we dealing with here? Uh, I assume the taxi fleet is not in this list? Correct, it is not. I could answer your, your question about what vehicles are in. It's the passenger vehicles that are City Hall predominantly, City Hall staff predominantly drive. It also does include like the parks and public works, and I mentioned the fire chief's vehicle already, but the, like, like their administrative pickup trucks are included in that as well. In, a, in addition to that are, so the vehicles that you see parked in this vicinity, <coughs> north and west of City Hall on the in our city parking lot, Many of them are retired squad cars that we've been using um, over the years. Some of those are purchased vehicles as well, some of the pickup trucks that we've bought over the years. It, it looks like like 30 vehicles, about? There's a total of 25, and then based on some underutilized vehicles, just with very low annual mileage, and Jay's team analyzing that analysis, there's now gonna be a total of 22. Okay, thank you. Alderman model. do you still have a question? And then um, what does the transition look like? I know it's kind of a weird question probably, but like the, the vehicles that you just alluded to, do you guys have resources for helping us get rid of those? Absolutely. So okay. what we would do is we'd put together a strategy for 2021 budget year, uh, get vehicles on order as soon as possible. Once they deliver after January 1st, 2021, uh, we would then deliver the new vehicles to City of West Bend turnkey. So if there were pickup trucks, for example, that needed you know, uh, salter, plow, uh, beacon lights, la ladder racks, whatever it might be, we'd have that uh, completed, delivered, and as soon as that new vehicle is delivered, we would then pick up the old one to turn around and sell for the city. You guys take care of that, sir. That is correct. So we do handle all the logistics, paperwork, and process. On average, it takes about 20 to 25 days money in the bank um, after picking it up, remarketing it through our sales channels which in turn is a benefit to the city and their taxpayers because we have over 200 different buyers that we sell enterprise cars to in just Wisconsin. Uh, Alderman Butchlick. Um, who would pay for the, um, like the plow and, and the lights and that? That would be the city's responsibility to add that on? That is correct. So we would be able to incorporate that into the actual lease. Uh, we do have some clients that just pay cash for any aftermarket equipment uh, that would need to be added to the vehicle to keep the vehicle separate from any of that extra cost. Okay, I've got a list here uh, from the last time you were here and looking at this list looks like majority of the items are um, either autos, uh, some of the pickup trucks, but the ones that I'm familiar with aren't with plows or lights, so evidently the cost would be at a minimum if there were going to be any vehicles that were gonna be used for that, so. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Alderman Allen, yep. Yeah, as, as I understand it, the vehicle, this is for Jay, the vehicles you're looking at doing here are not work vehicles, these are just the pickup truck that's used as a sedan, uh, those types of vehicles. Yeah, and by, by saying not work vehicles, certainly the, the, 
fire chief and the DPW director and Mike Yench's vehicle are quasi work vehicles. So they, they do hit a job site and they do have some lights that you mentioned, but they might transition from a hard mounted might a light to a um, magnet type light for the future if it's less disruptive to the, and those are conversations that as this program gets from presentation <laughs> stage to thumbs up and we're doing this stage that um, Steve Schmeling from our vehicle maintenance department will have directly with those department heads to and, and with these guys to determine the how and what of transitioning these vehicles out on an annual or every two year basis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep, Alderman Hooch, sir. How many squad cars do we pass down every year about? Three to four. Okay, so three to four, and how long do we keep them about? Depends on the vehicle, but whatever, however long Ballpark. Steve Schmeling tells us to keep them. Okay. Some of them you can see on, on this, if you get this list, Well, I mean, I know, I know what some of them look like. Ten years, yeah, sometimes. So the three or four that we do pass down that are already paid for, now we're going to replace them with vehicles we're paying for every year. Correct. You're paying for the least for the right, use of but, that vehicle every year. But we got four vehicles we're passing down that are totally paid off. Yep. So are we still going to do that, or are we just ignoring all of that and going to total lease? Yeah. So the this isn't for the the police vehicles at all. The police fleet would continue to be. No, no. I don't mean that. I mean, I know what you're saying. I, I know that they don't handle police packages. I'm saying when we pass down police, I think they would tell you that they do, but <laughs> we're not going. <laughs> okay, we're not going that route. I understand it. Phase okay. two, phase but three. When yeah. we pass down four vehicles that are completely paid for, yep, those vehicles would go to auction through the police department. So they that would offset their cost of purchasing new vehicles. It would insert more money into the chief's budget to to have that. Um, the only because the only vehicles we pay for now is if they, if one of those vehicles would go to. The water utility or the sewer utility they would pay they would compensate um, the, for the purchase of those vehicles because it's a separate okay so what funding you're, source what you're saying is we're going to auction them off and get some money back for them versus just saying to a department here's a car you can use correct and, and, okay and to be clear we do we do still auction off even after the 10 years of using a retired squad car and we we get surprisingly halfway decent money for that we would just get better money for it by auctioning the vehicle sure. sooner. <coughs> Who would want to drive around an old squad car? <laughs> <laughs> and the bene other benefit to that is your operating costs of maintenance, downtime, uh, running a healthier fleet of vehicles should minimize your maintenance and increase your fuel economy over time. Yeah. Okay. And thank you for giving that synopsis because that's what I was going to point to too, is the, the benefits are safer vehicles, better gas mileage, less maintenance, and just more predictable costs yeah. overall. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Well, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you, you for Thank you. presenting Thanks to us. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, we'll move on to uh, approval of the minutes. Uh, item number two, Common Council special meeting, June 15th at 5 p.m. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. There's many motions and approves. <laughs> uh, if there's no discussion of corrections, then all those in favor, sit up by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And item number three, Common Council regular meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Any discussion, corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And if I could have a motion to consent the agenda consisting of items four through 10. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on those? Seeing none, all those in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And moving on to uh, public hearing number 11, a public hearing regarding a scrap dealer's license for Quincy Recycle Paper, Inc., 2230 Stonebridge Road. If there's anybody here from the public who would like to speak, uh, please come up to the podium. If not, I'd be looking for a motion to end the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you. If there's no discussion on that, then all those in favor of closing the public hearing, signal by saying aye. 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 Thank you. So then moving on to number 12, granting of a scrap dealer's license for Quincy Recycle, Inc., 2230 Stonebridge Road. Motion to approve. Second. Been a motion, second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Moving on to item number 13, disallowance of a claim for Mr. Tom Rose. 
motion to disallow the claim. Second. Thank you. It's been a motion. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of denying, so no one saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, number 14, a disallowance of a claim for CRB Corporation, uh, Linda Miller. Motion to deny. disprove or deny. <laughs> okay. So been a motion, second to deny. Uh, if there's no discussion, then all those in favor, send by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Wonderful. Moving on. Uh, item number 15, relocate polling locations for August 11th, 2020 partisan primary. And we're going to have a brief presentation by our city clerk, Stephanie Justman. Steph. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Jenkins. Um, because we have time this time, um, and it's not under executive order, that I have in 30 days to ask for permission to move the polling locations for your upcoming election. I'm asking that we can relocate um, Cedar Ridge or Cedar Community, which is District 8, that would be moved here to City Hall, which is District with District 4, like it was for the spring election. I'm also asking that we move Meadowbrook Manor, which is District 1, and we would move that to the Washington County Courthouse. Um, that would be located in the lobby there like it was for the spring election. I'm also asking if we could move District 2, which is um, the library, over to the Public Agency Center, the PAC, which is also on Washington, Washington Avenue, and that is where District 5 is located. It's a large room there, which can accommodate both of the polling locations. Um, I had talked it over with John Kleinmaus, who is our chief inspector for District 2, and he likes the location. We're able to put District 5 on one side and District 2 on the other, that we can put the people um, with two separate entrances into the same room, but yet and all the poll, poll workers, if one was getting busier and the other one could help out the other poll workers with voter registration at the same time, allevi alleviating the need to have five polling poll workers if I have to go down to three because of um, people that do not want to work at the polls for the August election. It's unknown yet of how many poll workers I will be having. So I am just with, because this is more than 30 days before the August 11th election, I need council approval to move these voting locations. Well, if we do approve them, then I will go to the media. I know they already had an article on it um, to advertise to our residents or to our voters that the polling locations will be moved for the August election only. I will have to come up with another game plan for the November election because that'll be a different uh, number of voters for this election currently for District 2. I know that Mark uh, Alderman Allen had some concerns. Um, for the August election in 2018, I had 700 voters total at District 2. Um, that included your absentee voters. Right now, I have approximately 550 voters that are voting absentee for District 2 that I have in the mail right now. Um, so we're estimating about 200 voters that would be at District 2 or at um, the majority of the voting locations would have about 200 voters at the polls that we had a little bit more than that for the April election. Typically, your August election is much lower voter turnout. So I would recommend that um, you'd approve moving these voting locations for the August 11th partisan primary. Are there any questions? Are you looking for a motion, by the way? Yes. All right. Well, we got a motion from Alderman Kaler. Is there a second? Second? OK. Uh, I just had a quick question, and then we can open up as well. All right. Um, so I, I guess I understand District 1 and District 8 because those are the more at-risk populations who are there. Uh, can you explain District 2 again, uh, why the library needs to get moved? Is it more congestion? Or? Um, yes, because I was looking at it that the school is still not in session on August 11th, so you'd have the younger population. And right there, your polling location, they have to go through the children's area just to get to the polling place. So that's what I was looking at, less congregating of people in that area. Okay. I saw uh, Alderman Kennedy, and then I'll go to Alan. Yeah, I just had a question. I know District 8 is on here to move, and I know you said it's not, you haven't decided anything for November yet, because um, this is obviously further out than 
Cedar Ridge would have been. Um, two questions. One is the merging of District 4 and District 8 into the same place. Are we expecting double the lines, or are you doing the same thing? We have one entrance for District 4, one entrance for District 8 people. It will it'll be the same setup as we had for the spring election. So District 8 would come in and be in the police classroom, or District 4 would be. And District 8 would come in and be in the Common Council area here. Okay, so two separate rooms, yes. so not all in the same line. Yep. Okay. Which really worked out nice for if the socially distancing dots on the floor and stuff. People had adequate um, room. Okay, and you said this is not for November. This is no, only the I August have to, election. I have to okay. really think about November, how we're going to handle that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alan? Yeah, I, I, I understand District 1 and District 8 because both of those polling locations are located inside buildings that have already said, if you, don't, if you don't live here, you don't belong here. You're not even welcome. I mean, I can't go to Cedar Ridge even today. They, that is, you know, restricted to people that live there. So I understand that. The same situation in Meadowbrook. Um, We've thrown the library open and said, oh, there are no restrictions. So I'm, why so close to the election are we looking to move the polling location out of the library? I, I, I have no objection to uh, dealing with District 1 and District 8 in a responsible manner, but uh, not so much with District 2. I guess I was just looking at my past experience with elections. I don't feel that there's going to be a lot of people. So I would just assume that we can put these two together, District 5 and District 2, in one location so that if I do not have enough poll workers for that day, they can work off of each other and help each other out at that location. Whereas in District 2, if they're dropping low on poll workers in there, because I, I just know with April we had a lot of new first time voters and so when you fill out a voter registration it takes more time so at district if district two is at district five one person can be doing their voter registrations for both districts so that's what i was looking at also and plus that i just it's completely up to common council if they don't want to move district two it's completely up to do, up to you however i would recommend that you would move it just for this august election just for the fact is i don't know what programs are happening that week at the library and i just as soon um, alleviate that congregation of people have we considered closing the library for one day i don't know if that's our call that would be up to the library board correct right. yeah it might be something that i would recommend for November 3rd. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea numbers on past August elections? Um, total voters, day? I had about, I had about, on August 2018, I had 5,000 voters, and right now I have almost 4,000 absentee ballots in the mail. So you just about have as many people voting by absentee as we had for the total election for August. There will be very low turnout at your polling locations because it is a partisan primary. And I'm not gonna go into the legalities of a partisan primary, but you have to pick a party and vote within your party. And there isn't the need or the urge to vote at a partisan primary. Because at a primary, you do not have a winner, you're just eliminating one person or two people in some cases. Are there any contested primaries? Contest? Are there? Yes, In there is words, one race. There's only one race, and that would be under the Republican race, and that is for um, Jim Sensenbrenner's seat for the Republican Party. There are two people running, so one would be eliminated at the August election, and that is the only contested race there is on that ballot. Are there any other questions for Steph? Will we um, potentially put like signs at the say we don't do the library? Would you put a sign like? not polling here today please go to this address just yeah. so people would obviously yes, be aware yes. before they go get, get out of their car and yes i plan on putting signs up in the doorway there like i did for the cedar community in meadowbrook um, we can do that a couple weeks ahead of time also when you go on my vote and you look at find my polling location as long as i know this i'll set up the election plan that when you put in your address it's going to say that you go to um, pac to vote that day it won't say the library. 
and that will be also be on your on the website and on Facebook. I will put it on, and I'll probably be on Hey West Bend, just trying to get the word out to the people. Got it. Are there any other questions? Are, yeah. Not having voted at the public agency center, uh, maybe somebody can who does vote there, Steve, <laughs> can can respond with, you know, it, it just seems I, I drove over there, and and you go in and you come out onto 33. Um, I I got a lot of constituents that wouldn't probably be comfortable with crossing 33 to. It's Judd Dolnick's district. It's district, district five. District. He's at the Washington County Courthouse. Alderman Hoogester is the Washington County Courthouse. That would be my district. It's and I voted. Years. I voted there for years, and you can get there off of Indiana Avenue, in and out on Indiana Avenue, or in and out on Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's I wasn't aware not of the a problem. Back way, so yeah. all roads lead to the PAC. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One way or another. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's no other discussion. We do have a motion second on the floor. All those in favor of that, signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Thank you. And that motion passes. Uh, next up is item 16, resolution to enter into a memorandum of understanding with Washington County for the development of a transportation sustainability plan. Um, all the council should be briefed at least on uh, what this is in relation to. Um, it's really just initiating and starting the process to work with our county neighbors on developing a strong planning tool, uh, really looking out for our long-term infrastructure and building, uh, I would say, that collaboration and relationship uh, with the county. Um, if we initiate this, I believe the uh, village of Kewaskum is investigating the same thing, as well as I recently heard the city of Hartford. Um, so it'd be nice to buy into this collaboration while we can. Again, if we approve this resolution, it would go to the county's uh, public works committee and then to their full county board, as in the county board would be taking on the uh, burden, the, the fiscal burden of uh, providing this for our municipality and possibly the others if they support it as well. Uh, I know Jay is here as well if we have any other questions, but we can open it up for discussion. What kind of commitment is this? Like dollars and cents and so manpower and all that kind of stuff. This is just a plan, right? Yep. The, um, Mayor Jenkins. If you don't like it, we can do something else. <laughs> yep. Or what? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Jenkins. Josh Showman, County Executive, mm -hmm. um, Highway Commissioner Max and Doug met, and Emily met with um, me, and we we all reviewed the existing plan that they have, the 2050 Sustainability Plan. That their their stated goal. I just called the document up. It's available on their website. Their stated goal for their plan is to determine the level of funding necessary to maintain reliable infrastructure to provide effective mobility. The annual cost of what every every chunk of road within the within the county system would cost through 2050 is what their stated goal was. They started with an inventory, they inventoried all their roads. They had a mis mishmash of of previously inventoried roads and and different data sets, and they jammed them all into an access database that they're in and had a GIS tied to it that they're willing to do and work with our staff. In, in doing for the city of West Bend. Ours is going to be a little more complicated because we have sewer and water utilities with, within these roadways that, are, that also have a shelf life and have a very level of you know, um, timeline left on them and cost to, to improve them. That, that's going to be a ch challenging um, endeavor for them. We, we work in and our, we certainly plan currently. Our engineering staff and utility staff work together and decide which roads bubble up to the top of the five-year CIP plan, as you guys know. But we really don't have, and Max shared with you a monster number of what it would cost to fix all the roads, but we don't know that monster number divided by X on an annual basis. That That's the, the interesting, um, one of the really interesting topics for me to, to determine is what it, what is that number to determine the level of funding necessary to maintain. You guys went and made a decision to go from an annual um, borrowing of one million to two million 
and Max and his team certainly adjusted to that. And there's definitely road need. We know that. But what is that? What is that number? Is it two million? Is it two million plus X? That's really what this plan will get for us on an annual basis, not just for road, but for utility as well. And that two million, you guys all know, is just the roadway. The utility is also spending a significant amount on an annual basis. Well, and and I in particular just saw an example of that with the end of Roosevelt Drive and Max's like inability to immediately go to a like a program. I mean, I don't know what would that involve writing new software or something like that to be able to pull up what a sewer water utility versus a road in the city might be? I mean, actually, the county is talking about creating software for this plan and yeah. one that can be rep more easily replicated, as the mayor mentioned. Other municipalities within Washington County are contemplating having this plan created for well, them. Well, to be able to make adjustments well. and stuff like that, too. As far as cost, they plan on doing it in-house, so they're going to use their, their county staff and their software to create it. It's certainly going to be... A level of effort for Emily Max and, and our utility folks and our contracted um, consultant engineer as well but it's all of that data that we currently maintain that we'll be providing to the county to to jam into this magical box and have it spit out a, a <laughs> sustainability plan at the end and I know it was really attractive and I don't speak for Max because he's not here but but I know both from his perspective and myself as an administrator as well, is we're really tied into that five-year kind of schematic, and, it's, and it can be frustrating. So I, I, I agree that, that having that tool and ability to truly look beyond five years as much as we can, I mean, that's only going to be advantageous to us as a city. Um, yep, sure. <laughs> All right, Go ahead, make your motion, and we'll get back to discussion. <laughs> no, I, that's right. I mean, See, actually, I, we should. I yeah, I'm breaking my own rules. Yeah, why don't, why don't you make a motion? Go ahead. That's fine. Second. Okay. Now, Alderman Allen, go ahead. Um, as I understand it, as I read this, we're not obligated to spend anything other than effort that we're already planning to expend anyway. Um, so I don't see a, a real financial impact, but... Uh, you're talking about uh, a GIS. We have a GIS department. Are they going to be engaged in this and share their expertise with the county? It sounds like the county is getting ready to get into GIS as opposed to, you know, we actually have something to bring to the table with a fully functional GIS department. We do, and yes, our GIS indiv individual will be a part of the sharing of data from the city as well. The county does have a, a full GIS department. They they have three regular GIS employees and one recently retired, so they have two right now in a vacancy. But they they absolutely have a, a GIS department that's fully functioning. Oh, okay. The way it was just presented, it sounded I, like, oh, I they're going to start a GIS. And I, I think what the, what I was trying to reflect is, is Scott Schmidt, who is the highway commissioner's um, comment that I think they surprised themselves a little bit when they created this plan, when they created their plan, that they ended up using more GIS and less highway commissioner, less engineer time, that the GIS individual really drove the sustainability plan and creation at the county. So mm -hmm. he's going to be heavily involved in this plan as well if we move forward. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion, questions? Seeing none, I will call for a vote on the resolution. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We'll move forward and report uh, next steps. Uh, we'll move on to reports. Uh, item number 17, a report by Alderman Burquist regarding the library board meeting. Thank you, sir. The last library board meeting was held on June 16th. After taking care of the usual board business, approving the agenda, the last minute, or meeting's minutes, and the financial reports, we heard from the library director with her monthly report. She reported that the library is serving anywhere between 250 and 450 people per day since reopening, compared to 500 to 600 people per day normally. The summer reading programs have started, but are being done virtually on Zoom and Facebook Live. Uh, the attendance is being tracked by information provided by those platforms. The director was asked if the library has improved its procedures or techniques in dealing with the pandemic. 
Uh, she said that they have, and while still maintaining a 72-hour quarantine on return materials, ensuring hygiene for guests and staff, and dealing with some staffing issues. Uh, she is looking at reinstating the volunteer program at some time uh, with some adjustments uh, for liability concerns. The West Bend Library is a member of the Monarch Library System who has been dealing with staffing issues of its own. Uh, they have been without a director until just this week when it was announced that Kimberly Young of Michigan had been selected to lead the organization. Uh, we had discussion concerning the Library Recreation Center and the pre-bid agreements and where the library stands on the issues. The last item uh, to discuss was to allow the library director the ability to increase hours without board approval. Uh, she had pr proposed uh, adding Saturday hours to accommodate those people who couldn't get to the library during the previous Monday through Friday 9 to 5 hours. The motion carried with an understanding that any decrease in hours needed board approval. Uh, the board then went into closed session to discuss the library director's evaluation and that was it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions for Alder Member Quist? Seeing none, I'll move to item number 18, a report by Alderman Hoodister or Alderman Kennedy regarding the Park and Rec Commission meeting. I can take it. <laughs> we actually didn't have one, so oh, that was go. easy. Um, but we do have uh, an upcoming um, a request for proposals is going out on the All Abilities uh, Children's Playground, and then we are going to have a separate meeting um, before the board um, that will look at reviewing all the proposals, including community members and stakeholders, to kind of uh, review those options and what's before us, um, and then come to the board with some options for them to review um, and then there will be another parks and rec meeting i believe it's the 23rd is our next meeting and i believe it's going to be hosted at out outdoors at regner park great exciting stuff any questions for alderman kennedy uh seeing none i'll move on to item number 19 a report by alderman butchlick regarding the deer management committee meeting good evening um we had a presentation from the usda wildlife services um Charles Lovell. Um, he explained their activities over the past um, six months. They originally, back in December 6, 2019, they used an unmanned aerial vehicle equipped with a camera that was infrared. And um, they went through six different properties. They started at dusk and continued into night using the infrared camera, observing minimum count but the actual estimate they figure was likely higher. Uh, they stated that it is not believed that deer were double counted at a particular park because the survey at each site were fairly short and in most situations the UAV did not cause the deer to flee. So a total of 151 deer were observed from all those six locations just from, um, they removed Deer on January 29th, February 5th, 12th, and the 25th, and March 4th, 11th, and the 17th, for a total of 58 deer removed. The deer were actually taken to Leroy Meats in Fox Lake, where they were processed into ground venison, and a total of 1,200 pounds were donated to the full shelf pantry of West Bend, which they were very pleased with the coronavirus. Um, they definitely were very happy to, to see that meat coming. Chip also stated that they did not have any problems this year with any um, interference or any damage done to their equipment, so they were very pleased. The public is beginning to understand it's really important. They did do a CWD sample on all 58 deer, and everyone was free of CWD. Uh, they recommended to the city to conduct another UAV survey in fall of 2020 to estimate the deer population within each park. We are going to probably add Regner Park to that list, and that would give us an idea of whether we needed to depopulation is warranted. Is warranted. It is suggested that the city again pursue an urban wildlife grant for by the Department of Natural Resources for any deer or goose management. Uh, Chip also com uh, complimented the Park and Rec Department um, for their uh, assistance in removing any um, 
any items that was needed to be moved from the deer and that and they always had uh, equipment there for them to make sure everything was taken care of uh, again this was a huge success um, and if it bear we will be definitely looking at trying to do another one again um, in fall thank you great thank you any questions for all my budget like on my model yeah um john do you guys uh track at all like the accidents and stuff and hostas eating that kind of stuff yeah as a matter of fact <laughs> um um brian sent me an email and it was very interesting i never in a million years realized that we had that many deer versus autos in the city of west bend and i counted them for 2018 we had 33 and 2019 we had 36 throughout the city now i looked at the c ones what areas were were they really heavy i figured 18th avenue would be a a real heavy populated area both items both both years were only three or four deer were actually hit on 18th but they were spread out all over the city river road east uh, north side of river road south side of river road up in Barton, there were on Main Street, Barton Avenue had a few up there. It, it was amazing. It was actually very interesting. Um, they had, did have from 2018 to 2020 or 2019, they had three actually injuries due to uh, vehicle versus deer. So there were three people that were actually injured when, when they hit a deer and it was in the city. I so, shot that one on Barton Avenue, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alderman Kaler. Just curious, we must have shot some awfully small deer. <laughs> 1,200 pounds on 58 deer is just over 20 pounds a year. We must have shot some really little deer. They did. <laughs> Bambi is no more. I don't know. Did, did you have a comment to that, John? If, if not, then uh, Alderman Allen. Yep. Yeah, uh, what's the target herd size for West Bend? I mean, are we planning to completely depopulate <laughs> deer in the city limits? No, we're not. We're, we're just trying to get the deer population in, in control. And right now, we're way above, according to CHIP, we're way above the number of deer in the amount, of the, the area that the city has listed. And I, Jay, unless you remember what it was, but we were definitely... Yep, I, I'm just calling it up. I, I have an email from Eric Kilborn within the DNR, and I'll find the number. That's not the right email. And is the deer population number based on just the city parks? Or, I mean, there are people that have large tracts of land that that are not city parks but certainly but, are deer habitat yeah the deer part the, the parks are over overcrowded because they did give us an estimate like at Lac Lorraine Lac Lorraine is only supposed to if I am correct there's only supposed to have approximately uh, 13 um, 15 deer in it and this year they dropped 20 This year they dropped 23 at Lac La Rin. Last year they dropped 28. And they were a total of 51 spotted at Lac, Lac La Rin during the survey. Our, yeah, and then Ridge Run Park had a total of 71 deer. And they, they actually um, got 29 this year at Ridge Run. So technically, Ridge Run obviously is a lot bigger park, and I would think that that number would be a little higher than what Lac Loren, but Lac Loren was, I'm almost positive, was between 15, 13 and 15 deer. That would be the populated area for that acreage. All right, looks like we got those numbers got it, over here. Yep, the, the deer... This is from Chip, I'm, my bad, I thought it was from the DNR, but uh, the, he shares the, the 
deer numbers. So 92 deer were counted at Ridge Run over a, an approximate area of 0.65 square miles or 400 acres. And Lac La Ron had 59 deer counted over 0.35 square miles or 224 acres. To maintain a healthy deer population, healthy forest deer density should be less than 20 deer per square mile. And we had numbers of 92 deer over, you know, two thirds of a mile and 59 deer over a third of a mile on those two parks. So the, 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 rest, the recommended number is 20 deer per square mile. So I, I think the answer is once they fly the drone and they count deer more in the number of 20 per square mile, that's when they'll, they'll recommend to stop taking some. But they don't, I mean, are we only looking at city parks? Is that parkland the only thing we're looking at for the total deer population? Because those deer roam into non-parks. Right, but the only thing that we have flown is, is city parks. They have found, and I think we're gonna find when we, when we fly Regner, that there are, the guys call them park deer, <laughs> but deer that hang out in, no doubt they move around, but deer that hang out at, at Regner, and if you walk the trails and hang out at Regner enough, you can have deer come right up to you at, at Regner Park. It's not uncommon to get as close as mm -hmm. six feet from a, a deer. I've snapped some photos of some personally. And they're packing. And they're not, <laughs> I don't know if they're packing, but they're, they're friendly. All right. I can share that email if that's helpful with, for the council. Any other questions on the walking venison? Nope. All right. Thank you, John. And then finally, at number 20, a report by Alderman Model regarding the historic Barton Business Association meeting. Thank you, Mayor Jenkins. Um, the historic, the histor I'm the chair for the uh, HBBA, for anybody that doesn't know. Um, the historic Barton Business Association met this past Wednesday, as we will every other week until the end of summer. Obviously, the HPBA is affected by the coronavirus as everyone else, and looking at a severely scaled back agenda for this year, we will not let this keep us from getting things done. Just to reiterate, our mission for the HPBA has always been the beautification and socialization of Barton with the intention of creating a healthier and happier environment for businesses and residents alike. To address the elephant in the room, we have never acted with malicious intent or engaged in misappropriation of anything, period. I, we love our community and from the beginning have acted with a positive attitude and the best of intentions. To suggest otherwise is ridiculous. This summer, we'll be reestablishing the old garden in front of the roller mill and next to the Eisenbahn Trail to be called the Barton Garden. This project began this morning and was designed by a local master gardener. We are also exploring lighting up the dam, perhaps with multiple colors to correspond with seasons and holidays. We will be installing the seventh bike rack in the coming weeks, continuing the process of making Barton a bike friendly part of the city. We are planning a brat fry for August 8th from 10 to, 10 to 3 in front of Glass Block on Main Street. We are also planning to do Barton Day on September 12th to include a band, food, and car show, amongst other things. Obviously, this will depend on pandemic conditions at the time. If anyone has any questions or concerns regarding myself or the HBBA, I've got other representatives here. Um, I would be more than happy to address them at this time. Are there any questions for Alderman Motto? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any other announcements for the go to the order? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we operate the common council meetings in a socially distanced manner and I would like to remind people that means you don't approach people to uh, talk to them closely you, sh need, you should be maintaining uh, six feet of separation so just a reminder also the uh, CDC has revised their guidelines for mask wearing and they now recommend masks Anytime you're in a public situation. Thank you. Any other announcements? Seeing none, I will adjourn by the call of the chair. Have a great evening.